Good evening, everyone. I'm Shelby Monier, Vice President of Zero's Patient Education and Programs. Uh, welcome back to Zero's Virtual Prostate Cancer Summit of 2021. We hope that you've enjoyed all of the programming so far. On this final day, we have some really exciting topics lined up for you. We're really focusing on bringing you some of the new and exciting advances in prostate cancer on our last day, especially when it comes to detection and treatment. So with that, I wanna give a quick thanks to our sponsor for this particular talk. Um, our sponsor tonight is MyAvent. Thank you to MyAvent for your support and for helping us bring this valuable content to you. So with that, our first speaker of the evening on our final day is Dr. Daniel George. Dr. George is a medical oncologist at Duke Cancer Center and will be sharing with us some advancements in andro androgen deprivation therapy or ADT. Uh, to help us better understand the differences between a new exciting oral drug and injectable therapy that we're a little bit more familiar with. So with that, welcome, Dr. George. Thanks so much for being here, and I'll let you steal the show. Oh, thank you, Shelby. And thanks, everybody, for joining to, uh, today, this, this afternoon, evening, uh, and uh, hope, um, hope we can make this uh, an interactive session. I'm going to go through probably about 40 slides here or so, and then... Um, and then if, um, if you have questions, um, I'd love to hear from you. You can also put them in the, the chat uh, and Shelby can go through those. And, uh, and you know, if, if you're dying to, you can interrupt, that's okay. I've been interrupted before, so that's fine too. Um, anyway, I wanted to talk to you about updates in hormonal therapy for advanced prostate cancer. And as many of you know, this is not a new subject. This is a field that's been around for 70 years. But there are advances going on, and uh, there is a new drug that has come into the field, and I wanted to put that into some context for you all um, around um, how we're thinking about prostate cancer. So first, just some background around the scope of prostate cancer, uh, some of the issues that um, we deal with, um, and then around hormonal therapy, and in particular, some of the medical complications that um, patients need to be aware of associated with long-term hormonal therapy, or what we refer, refer to as androgen deprivation therapy, where we're lowering testosterone down, uh, either surgically or nowadays, mostly chemically, uh, and those complications from cardiovascular disease to um, insulin insensitivity and, and, you know, frank diabetes to osteoporosis and fracture. Uh, there's many more uh, issues, and we'll touch upon some of the cognitive and um, mood changes that can also be associated with this, but, but um, you know, all of these are essentially wrapped up into uh, the process of aging and, and age interacts with hormonal therapy. And so we'll, we'll touch upon a little bit of the data suggesting um, that the impacts of, of the, this androgen deprivation therapy do vary by age. And then finally about frailty and, and how aligned these symptoms and complications are with the frailty of our patients. And then I'll switch gears to our novel GNRH oral antagonist, um, uh, uh, Relugolex or, or, or Govex, and, and the data that supports its use. And then finally a summary and, uh, and open it up to questions. So just a little background on prostate cancer, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's a very common cancer in men. It's, it accounts for about a one in five uh, cancers in all men in the United States. And it's the second leading cause of cancer deaths uh, in the United States uh, for men. Uh, and, and we screen for this disease and, and we should screen for this disease. And I'm happy to talk about screening for prostate cancer another time. It's near and dear to our heart uh, at Duke. Uh, where I practice, but thankfully most patients because of screening are diagnosed in a localized disease state, um, but roughly five to 10% are not um, either locally advanced or metastatic and up to 40% of those localized disease patients do recur. So it is a, a chronic problem for many patients uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer. And hormonal therapy is, as I said, it's androgen deprivation therapy. It works primarily by lowering testicular testosterone in it. And the drugs that we most commonly use are called GNRH agonists um, or antagonists. And we'll talk about the antagonist mechanism as well. And, um, you know, that's a funny name. Most people are gonna not remember what GNRH stands for. It's gonadotropin releasing hormone. And it's not so important, the name, but the function. 
GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone is made in the hypothalamus. It's a little gland in the brain. And we usually think of the brain as being an organ full of um, neurons, but there are actually glands in the brain as well. And the hypothalamus is one of them. And it secretes a, a hormone that goes into the bloodstream, goes everywhere in the body, but it works primarily at the, its next door neighbor, the, the pituitary gland, where um, it will uh, bind to receptors and cause the release of two other hormones. So one hormone causing the release of two other ones. One's called FSH, that's follicular stimulating hormone, and the other one called luteinizing hormone or LH. Again, names aren't as important. Just know that there are particular hormones that again, go into the bloodstream and circulate everywhere in the body, but they primarily work on the testes. In the, in the testicles, they'll stimulate different cells in the body. And in particular, the Leydig cells are the ones that the luteinizing hormone is stimulating to secrete testosterone. And testosterone shown there, it's a chemical, it's, it's, it's a cholesterol, uh, so uh, kind of like a fat. Uh, it's, a, it's a molecule that can circulate widely in the body and, um, and has lots of effects in all kinds of tissues that we'll talk about. But it gets um, metabolized. It gets broken down into um, different um, forms. One is dihydrotestosterone, which is really a more active, more potent form of testosterone. And another is um, estradiol, estrogen. And in men, you know, the estrogen that men have comes from their testosterone levels. So what happens um, in under normal circumstances is that this is tightly regulated uh, circular system where the LH and FSH cause activation in the testes. And then that testosterone on the LH side there circles back. And you'll see this sort of dotted line back to the brain and the hypothalamus where, and, and the pituitary where it circles back and it will shut off the signals. It'll block the signals and sort of desensitize, if you will, the signals of uh, the GnRH hormone in the pituitary and stop the release of LH. So when the testosterone levels reach a certain level, they penetrate into the brain. And at that level, it causes a, a desensitization to this hormone. As those levels drop, the uh, GNA, the pituitary becomes sensitized again, and it re-releases that those hormones and stimulates that process again. So you sort of see this sort of ebb and flow of this, but it kind of keeps it all within a tight range. So the way that the GnRH agonists work is that they mimic the GnRH hormone from the hypothalamus. And so they keep that process, they keep that signal going, and they actually cause an initial surge to kind of overreact the pituitary. So you get a, a high level of testosterone. And that initial surge sur surges back to the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And it causes, uh, again, this desensitization. But instead of the hypothalamus shutting off its GnRH and the pituitary becoming desensitized, the pituitary becomes desensitized, but because there's continued GnRH agonist present, because it's a depot, keeps present, it keeps the pituitary desensitized. And that stays desensitized even as the testosterone levels drop. So rather than their sort of GnRH going down and then back up again, it's constant. And as long as it's constant, the pituitary stays desensitized. And so that's how an agonist will work to kind of slowly kind of numb the process, if you will, to uh, this kind of pulsatile release of hormones. Now, the antagonist is different. The antagonists work by blocking, by specifically blocking the receptor. And by specifically blocking, not downregulating the receptor, then what that does is it immediately shuts down the signal of FSH and LH, so you don't get this surge. In addition, it doesn't matter if the hypothalamus keeps producing the GnRH because we're blocking at the receptor level downstream of it. And that GnRH can be there, but it doesn't matter. We're going to block it. It's not going to work either in the pituitary or anywhere else in the body where GnRH receptors might be present. And believe it or not, there are GnRH receptors in other tissues, including vascular tissues that may affect some of the cardiovascular effects that we're seeing. And by blocking that GnRH signal, anywhere in the body, not just the pituitary, it differentiates the agonist from the antagonist in terms of this, this hormone and this biology. And estrogen is a, 
a big reason why we can see some of the differences and changes that we're going to talk about in terms of side effects. It's not just the loss of testosterone, it's the loss of estrogen as well that may be affecting everything from our cognitive function to our bone density. So, um, you know, we, we tend to focus on testosterone, but really it's a composite of hormones that are being affected by these pathways. Okay, that was a long slide. Um, so let me pick it up a little bit. Uh, prostate cancer is uh, a disease that hits in the later decades. You don't see uh, very many teenagers with prostate cancer, thank goodness. Uh, 20 somethings, very rare. Occasionally we'll see people in their 30s and it's rare. It really starts in men in sort of their mid 40s. And then we see the rates go up. And you can see the, the most common diagnosis is men 65 to 74. I think to some extent, this is related to our screening as well, because we do see men in their 70s and 80s with prostate cancer. We just don't screen them as much. And men over 84 to be diagnosed with prostate cancer is pretty rare. But the reality is, is if you biopsy men in their 80s, you would find a lot more prostate cancer. So some of that drop off isn't because the disease is going away. Partly that is, um, you know, our screening bias. The median age of diagnosis is 66 and Medicare age. And if you look at men who are being treated with this androgen deprivation therapy, it also varies by age. So younger men tend to want to do things like surgery and avoid hormonal therapy. And in our older populations, we tend to use hormonal therapy a little bit sooner, maybe a little bit more regularly. So this is some data from SEER, which is a Medicare uh, database. So starting at age 65 and moving on up from there. And if you look right here at the overall cohort, almost half of the men are getting hormonal therapy. And that's not necessarily true in the overall population. So this is probably a little bit biased, but it's primary treatment as essentially the only treatment for the prostate cancer, that's 14%. For um, in combination with radiation therapy, that's another 15%. And then, um, and you can see sort of, again, sort of these other settings where they're using it in combination with surgery or, or, or with seed therapy um, or, um, or, or other potential, maybe with chemotherapy or other potential settings. Um, and if you look here at the men 80 and over, it's even higher. We see even a much higher rate, particularly in the men where it's the only treatment. So for a lot of older men, um, people aren't offering things like surgery and radiation therapy, and maybe that's appropriate because they're older, they're not necessarily going to live as long as somebody 65, but still, you know, we don't really know how long some of these men will live. Some of them will live a long time, and there may be some undertreatment in some of these patients. So the bottom line is, I think treatment with hormonal therapy, it's common, and this is a common disease, and understanding these complications associated with it is really gonna be critical because men who are receiving this hormonal therapy generally receiving this fairly early on in their course, either upfront as their primary treatment or with relapse disease. And many of these men could still live for 10 years or more. And the consequences of all that hormonal therapy on their you know, quality of life and survival are really critical. Um, I like this slides came from a colleague of mine uh, at Duke and it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of this sort of cradle to grave uh, view of um, physical and cardiometabolic side effects of hormonal therapy. And, it, and it's just showing that a lot of the side effects of hormonal therapy are actually paralleling the side effects of aging from that sort of middle age point onward. Not that we're growing mustaches and beards with hormonal therapy, but you can kind of see the effects on, on men physically. And, and there's a real um, sort of anatomical change associated with this. There's an increase in body fat. There's a decrease in lean muscle mass. There's a decrease in bone mass associated with it. That's the body composition. There's a functional effect uh, where we're losing muscle strength and physical performance. There are cardiovascular and metabolic effects on triglycerides and, and hormones and cholesterol. And um, there's in, increased insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and risk of diabetes. There's arterial stiffness. We talk about stiffness as we age, you know, being less flexible. It's happening in all sectors of our body, including our arteries. And it's really critical because it's, it's, we're seeing a, a real 
uh, exponential increase in the cardiovascular risks associated with that. And there's quality of life changes and fatigue associated with uh, hormonal therapy. Um, some of the metabolic complications, medical complications associated with um, uh, androgen deprivation therapy are outlined here again, um, sort of a, another list. But I, I like this slide because it points out one that we, we sometimes hear about, but um, is rarely um, seen and recognized. And that's something called sarcopenia. People say sarcopenia, what does that mean? Well, think of sarc like sarcomas, they're, they're like connective tissue and muscle. So that's kind of an old Greek word for that. And penia just means a, a loss. So we're seeing a loss of muscle. And typically what goes along with that loss of muscle is a gain of fat. And in this case, this gentleman, you can see he's gone from A to B. And what you see in these large gray, sort of light gray, uh, if you can see my, my cursor here, these light gray kind of ovoid circles, those are his rectus muscles. Those, that's the, the, the proverbial six pack uh, that, that, that men have buried underneath their subcutaneous fat. Uh, and it's, while they're strong and healthy, those muscles are, are, are round and flush. And as we age and weaken, those muscles soften and lighten, and you can barely see some of them anymore. And, uh, and what's replaced is all this adipose, all this fat uh, above it, which is subcutaneous fat. But interestingly, in addition to subcutaneous fat, look inside here. On this uh, gentleman on A, you see very little of the black in between uh, his bowels and blood vessels and what have you. Uh, he's lean. He's got very little fat inside what we call visceral fat surrounding his internal organs. But this gentleman, uh, and I don't think these are the same gentleman, uh, this gentleman uh, here in B has a lot of this gray black fat in between his, uh, his, his organs and that's called visceral fat. And all of that is what is causes this metabolic syndrome. It doesn't come out of thin air. It's made, it's made by hormones and it's hormones that are made by this visceral fat that essentially functions like an endocrine organ, like your pancreas or your thyroid or your adrenal glands. So it's really interesting biology. It's really visible biology that we can see on CT scans, but it's rarely commented on uh, in, your, in your CT scan reports. Um, but it is something that if you look at the images and you go back and maybe look at CAT scans on yourself from five years ago, you might see some changes. The leading cause of death in the United States is cardiovascular disease. And, and that is under threat from the risk of cancer. Thankfully, we've been making headways in both of these. And for a while, it looked like cancer was gonna replace heart disease as the leading cause of death. And just as it did, we saw rates of cancer death declining. And I think that's a, a, a really hopeful sign in the future, but they're really neck and neck. And, you, and I would say in our prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer populations, that's also the case. People get prostate cancer, we tend to think, oh my gosh, we gotta treat the cancer at all costs. But we forget that half of these patients will die from other causes. Um, besides heart disease, there's a whole bunch of other risks associated in here. Um, and, but they're all relatively low rates compared to cancer and heart disease. So, how does hormonal therapy cause cardiovascular disease in prostate cancer patients and survivors in particular? And there are a series of articles now that have really helped elucidate or clarify exactly the links between hormonal uh, androgen deprivation therapy and cardiovascular risk. And they're both direct and they're indirect. There are diabetes and cardiovascular disease risks so when you have these comorbid conditions and you start hormonal therapy, there's greater risk of these cardiovascular events, even greater than men who have diabetes, cardiovascular disease uh, at the same levels and age, but aren't starting on androgen deprivation therapy. And we can see these risks uh, at earlier stages of disease like localized disease. We can see this, uh, these risks causing cardiovascular death, not just heart attacks. And um, we can see uh, the impact of androgen deprivation therapy 
causing cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So whether it predated or whether it followed, uh, there are clear associations in both cases. Um, and their mechanisms are becoming more and more clear. This, what we term metabolic syndrome, is characterized by this increase in cholesterol, in triglycerides, in, um, in, in increases in triglycerides and decreases in the HDL, the good lip, lipids, if you will, uh, increase in this abdominal adipose tissue, that visceral fat that I talked about. So not just the stuff you feel on the outside, but the inside, and impaired glucose metabolism. And um, they influence the risk of myocardial infarction and diabetes. Um, and uh, there's some nice uh, papers that really looked at this data and demonstrating. Um, and we use these things called relative risks. Relative risk just means, you know, compared to sort of a baseline on the top here, it's, it's a baseline of no comorbidity. That's a, a, a risk of one and no androgen deprivation therapy. And then if you have no comorbidity, but you go on hormonal therapy, there's a small 9% increased risk of heart attack with that hormonal therapy. So just hormonal therapy alone without any other confounding conditions can increase your risk of a heart attack. But if you've had a heart attack, you're 72% more likely to have a second heart attack and you're at higher risk, 75% more likely to have a heart attack if you're on hormonal therapy. If you've had heart failure, that can increase your risk of a heart attack. Um, you can see peripheral vascular disease, stroke, and kind of go down the list here. The ones in dark are really the ones we're kind of highlighting in particular uh, at, at higher risk. And on the top here, they're the, the most uh, high risk ones. And those include things like heart failure and peripheral vascular disease, stroke, high blood pressure, and obesity. And age does too. It's interesting. But younger men who um, are um, treated uh, with um, short term courses of hormonal therapy, uh, you know, have actually men, regardless of age, who are treated with short courses of hormonal therapy, say less than two years, generally we're not seeing that great a risk of increased risk of um, these, these um, cardiovascular events. But as men age and as the starting dose, starting age of hormonal therapy increases into the 70s, we see this exponential increase in the risk of uh, having um, heart attack or stroke associated with hormonal therapy, particularly if you're on long-term hormonal therapy, so over two years. And you can see that odds ratio, again, that likelihood increasing uh, 90% um, in, in that population. So because of all of this risk, there are guidelines in our NCCN, um, uh, sort of our National Cancer Center Network uh, guidelines to um, encourage physicians to assess patients for cardiovascular risk before starting them on hormonal therapy and to, to use a team approach to engage primary care and cardi cardiologists or what's kind of a, a growing niche in cardiology, something called cardio-oncology. Um, and, and it's the ABCDE formula. So it's about awareness and aspirin. It's about blood pressure control. It's about cholesterol control and stopping cigarettes. It's about diet and diabetes and exercise. And these are all the things that can help mitigate some of these cumulative side effects of um, cardiovascular risk in men starting on hormonal therapy. If you look at the cause of death in the United States, uh, I showed this earlier, um, uh, this is a breakdown by age. And it's really interesting to see how um, the cancer deaths over 85 really decrease. Um, but what's increasing in that group of patients are things like dementia and stroke, um, uh, heart disease is increasing. And, um, uh, and, and then you look at the risk of diabetes, 2.8% in men 65 and older, 2.0% in men 85 and older. And you think, well, why are we worried about diabetes? It doesn't seem to be a big killer here in the United States. And yet it's really the perfect partner for all of these other conditions. Diabetes is exacerbating and worsening 
almost all of these other conditions from dementia, stroke, um, you know, renal disease, uh, lung disease, uh, certainly heart disease, even cancer uh, is complicated by uh, diabetes. And so um, looking at diabetes, not as a sole cause of death, but as a accomplice, if you will, in these patients is really critical. And that's what they did in this paper here, looking at diabetes and cardiovascular disease during androgen deprivation therapy. And it was interesting to see how these rates increased. Um, the incidence of diabetes um, with no treatment, the incidence of diabetes with that GnRH agonist went up, you know, really almost 50% in those patients. And, um, and again, if we look by age, those risks are increasing again in our men over 70. And it's having significant consequences in the other causes of mortality in this patient population. And so, again, that is the D of our guidelines. And, uh, and it's a really critical one to control. Another really critical one to control is osteoporosis. We in the field of oncology probably haven't paid enough attention to uh, the consequences of our weakened skeleton in patients and what role that plays in falls and fractures and debilitation and ultimately in shortened survival because of these complications. But um, there's a lot of different biology and mechanisms at play to cause this. And on the right here, you just see a picture of both normal bone as well as that osteoporotic bone, that sort of hollowing out, kind of honeycombing, if you will, of the bone, where a lot of those really nice, thick, calcified striata in the bone are thinned out, hollowed out. And you can see how that bone on the right would be much less stable compared to the bone on the left. And if you look at this, the mechanisms driving it um, are, are the skeletal response to this hormone that comes from this another endocrine gland uh, called the parathyroid hormone. Um, and this is made by uh, some small glands right next to your thyroid in your neck. And they really control the calcium um, levels in your blood and the calcium levels in your bone. And when your calcium levels in your blood are high, it means the calcium levels in your bone are probably low. And so being able to kind of monitor that and be able to, to use drugs that can help pull that calcium out of the bloodstream back into the bone is really critical. Those are some of the um, resorptive medicines we use to help strengthen the bone. Uh, low estrogens is probably one of the other big causes to causing that bone, to, that calcium to leach out of the bone and, um, and, and to, to really lower and, and alter that balance between these bone cells. There's two sets of bone cells, the osteoclast and the osteoblast. And the osteoclasts are the ones that break down bone and release that calcium out of the bone. And the osteoblasts are the ones that build that bone back up again and pull that calcium back in uh, into that bone striatum. So it's really critical that um, we, we monitor and maintain you know, calcium. Vitamin D is another really key hormone in this process um, you know, uh, to maintain all of this biology and, and, and not lose it. But but again, with a hormonal therapy, with androgen deprivation, they were also lowering estrogen. And that's primarily how we're lowering, we're causing this osteoporosis with androgen deprivation therapy. Again, one in five men over 50 will normally develop osteoporosis. So we think of this sometimes as a disease that's affecting women. But the reality is, is that, you know, 20% of men over 50, heck, I'm over 50, uh, have osteoporosis. And, uh, and then if you add in this uh, androgen deprivation therapy, and some of these men are on it for years, even a decade, those rates are going to go way up. So, and, and these rates go up with each decade of life. So that 20% could become 40 or 50% in a matter of a couple of decades. Uh, and with a consequence that is fracture. And these fractures can happen Sometimes, you know, with, 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 with just stepping out of a, uh, uh, you know, down a step or, or out a door, sometimes they happen from a fall or a trauma. Sometimes it can just happen spontaneously. But these are, um, the, these are the rates that we see 
And you can see with no androgen deprivation therapy, the, um, the adjusted fracture-free survival, I, I, I'm not really thought of it that way, but this is sort of the opposite of the rates of fracture going up. It's sort of the, the rates of being fracture-free of not having a fracture going down. And that top curve there, uh, you can see it uh, years after diagnosis of osteoporosis, we've got 30% of men are out there at year nine and 10 that have fractures, even if they haven't been on hormonal therapy. If they've just received just one to four doses of our GNRI jackets, that's usually about up to one year of treatment, it doesn't change much. But as soon as we get into that second year of GNRI jackets, we start to see these rates accelerate. And when you start to see men who are into their third year or more of um, GNRI agonists, the rates accelerate even further, really doubling those rates of fracture from maybe 30% down to, down to 50% or more. And you can see orchiectomy, a really completely irreversible form of this, this androgen deprivation therapy kind of associated with some of the highest rates. Um, and this, uh, these fractures can cause frailty. The, 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 they, they can, they're not just an issue for women, uh, they're an issue for men too, and particularly the fractures that are happening in weight-bearing bones. This is one here shown on the, the femur here. 20 to 25% of hip fractures can occur in men um, worldwide. So, so again, we think of this as, a, as more for women, and women are counseled about this early on and into menopause. Uh, men don't hear anything about it. Um, the mortality is twice as high for men who have a fracture than for women. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is because it's going undiagnosed. It's not being recognized for what it is. Uh, and they're more likely to have multiple fractures. And that mortality persists past the first year post-fracture and exceeds that for women. So again, it, you know, I think for women, um, this has been ingrained into the culture. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and when these happen, uh, they're, they're being, the association with osteoporosis is being made. I think with men, it's being ignored. It's being viewed as a one-off and, uh, and they're at risk for greater and greater complications. And again, what are the consequences of these hip fractures? Loss of mobility, uh, loss of independence, financial burden. I would also say deconditioning because when you have a fracture, you lose your ability to get up and around. And that loss of, of mobility results in, again, sarcopenia. It's gonna result in loss of muscle. It's gonna accelerate all the things that we're trying to decelerate or stop from happening. Again, back to our guidelines, it's in there. We recognize it, our national guidelines recognize it. Um, how many patients are really being counseled around this in the real world? probably far from 100%. And I can't say I'm perfect either, but I think you don't have to cover it every visit, but at some point you need to hear this and you need to hear about the, the supplements. You need to understand what these risks are. You need a baseline bone density test. We'll call it DEXA scan. And you probably need that every couple of years. And from those, we can calculate this. It's called a FRAX or a fracture risk assessment. It's a tool to, you know, based on uh, a number of parameters here, uh, the age and, and the sex and the weight and the height of the patient, whether they've had uh, fractures, whether they have a family history of fracture. Smoking increases your risk of fractures. Steroids increase your risk of fractures. So does arthritis. Um, and then again, you see this one, secondary osteoporosis. That means it's caused by a treatment. Um, and that's exactly what engine deprivation therapy would be secondary osteoporosis. And then you can see alcohol in there. From those, you can calculate these scores and you can see what your fracture risk is over a five or 10 year period. Well, switch gears now to depression and um, some of the psychological effects of um, cancer and hormonal therapy um, on patients. And, and it's, it's not surprising that our, our cancer patients are under stress and that stress is manifested in both anxiety and depression. And just looking across you know, the, the, the country, um, North Carolina sadly doesn't report this data but um, where I practice, but in most of the Southeast, we're seeing a fairly high rate of, um, uh, of, of major depression. And, um, and, and you can see its association with various chronic 
conditions. Uh, certainly, uh, like Alzheimer's or, or cardiovascular or stroke, diabetes, there's cancer right near the top, second only to Parkinson's disease, which is also, I think, very, very difficult on our patients physically uh, while maintaining their, 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 their mental capacities. Cancer does that too. It, it, it's a physically debilitating, uh, and I think mentally draining um, diagnosis on, on many patients. And you can see a very high rate of uh, depression and depressive symptoms that in many cases can go on. And guess what? Uh, androgen deprivation therapy makes it worse. And this is a large database series. Again, 78,000 prostate cancer, 43% on androgen deprivation therapy. So, you know, 57% who are not. And you can see the comparison here. Um, these rates, uh, prostate cancer depre and depression, these rates of depression go up uh, over the years with both, whether you had hormonal therapy or not. Just having prostate cancer increases those rates. But we can see about a 23% increase in the risk of depression in those men who are treated with androgen deprivation therapy. It doesn't matter if they're treated with androgen deprivation therapy and cured, say in the con context of hormones and radiation therapy, those risks are still in there and they're still higher. Well, here is just a litany of papers that speak to some of the cognitive functions. And this is something we probably don't talk about or measure enough in our patient populations. But as we age, we lose cognitive function. When we have men on hormonal therapy, that effect worsens even. And, and there are clear associations between hormonal therapy and risk of dementia. There's clear associations uh, specifically with Alzheimer's. Uh, there's um, just even non-dementia, um, just, just cognitive function decline, increasing and, and at various time points from anywhere from just you know, three years all the way out to 10 years or more. And, and lots of independent studies to support this. If you look here, just the significance in this one study that looked at the significant difference in cognitive function at one year in patients with prostate cancer, not on hormonal therapy or on hormonal therapy, you can see at baseline, there's already some decline in these men and it, it actually declines further. Um, it actually improves some in our controls. You can see as men um, are, are, um, are managed and, um, and treated for their cancer, but on hormonal therapy, it actually increases. And, and I think with that, um, you know, there's, you know there's, a, there's a psychological component here perhaps, but there's also likely um, a, um, a decline as well. Some of these tests um, patients learn on, they learn to do better. So some of that improvement in the control may just simply be the fact that they learn how to do these cognitive tests better. But we're not seeing that improvement with the androgen deprivation therapy. It really suggests that there's something prohibiting that learning and that, that improvement. So what are some of the psychological recommendations for care men on androgen deprivation therapy? Sadly, there are no specific guidelines around this. And, and I think it's a real unmet need for our field and for our patients in particular. Um, we do work uh, in a multidisciplinary team. We have, uh, at least at Duke, we have a psychiatrist that works specifically with us for our cancer patients. And for our prostate cancer patients in particular, we also have um, counselors that um, specifically work with our patients. But, um, but it is still probably an underserved um, you know, uh, complication in patient population. Sadly, there's no reversibility of this cognitive decline. Stopping the hormonal therapy doesn't necessarily reverse this. And, um, and recognizing that this too probably is worse in our older than our younger patients, um, you know, more data is really needed. But this is probably behind some of the other areas in terms of studying and understanding the biology and causes to this. And then lastly, when it comes to the side effects of androgen deprivation therapy, I, I like to sum it up this way. You know, in a word, hormonal therapy kind of ages you. These are all the things that happen to us as we age. We lose muscle mass. We develop more fatigue. We have less uh, reserve. Um, we, our bones thin, as we talked about, our increased risk of falls and inactivity. And in a word, that you can summarize all of those with the term frailty. 
because when we think about patience and we think about frailty, those are the things that really characterize frailty. There's a loss of that lean muscle mass. There's increased fatigue and exhaustion, increased osteoporosis, risk of falls and decreased activity. And these are the patients who are really just one complication away from life-threatening um, you know, consequences. And it's just, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the disease state that's not unique to prostate cancer, but it's the disease state that we, we all try to stay free from as long as possible. And androgen deprivation therapy, like it or not, is getting us one step closer. Well, there is some hope on the horizon. And it really started with this drug that came on the market about 10 years ago, Degarelix. And it's a GnRH antagonist. It's an injectable. It's injected once a month. And that's probably been the biggest hurdle to using it in men on a large scale basis because it's a drain on the health system. It's more expensive. Um, and it's difficult for patients to be in, have a shot a given every single month for months or years at a time. But in a large meta-analysis, they've been able to show that there's about a 50% decline in cardiac events just in the first year in patients treated with a GnRH antagonist versus um, an agonist. And uh, if you look at all patients versus those patients with previous cardiovascular disease, the, the, the rates are even higher, 56% reduction. So it really looks like you know, this is a, a mechanism and a strategy that at least on the cardiovascular side could have really a profound effect at decreasing one of the major complicating factors associated with androgen deprivation therapy. And with that, I wanna to talk to you about this drug, which I was fortunate to be part of the development team for um, uh, Relugolex, which is an oral androgen deprivation therapy for advanced prostate cancer. It's the first oral, meaning pill form of a GnRH antagonist. So it specifically, like Degarelix, blocks the signal from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to release its hormones and stimulate testosterone. So it has a more immediate effect on patients um, on their, um, on their uh, testosterone. And in this study, we did a large randomized study against Luprolide, one of those GnRH agonists. And it was a global study, including patients from Asia, from the United States, and from Europe in South America. And we were able to study in, in a two-to-one randomization, Relugolex versus Luprolide, treated for up to 48 weeks, one year of treatment. And we looked at the continuous testosterone suppression throughout the entire 48 weeks. And Relugolex actually demonstrated a superior rate of continuous testosterone suppression than Luprolide. And it met its mark for regulatory approval. This is the population of patients that were in the trial. If you look here, it's really interesting. 28% of the patients were over the age of 75. You can see the average age was 71, 72. You can see their breakdown in terms of North and South America, Europe, and Asia. We really had a wide representation. Their clinical disease states, about half of the patients had recurrent disease after say surgery or radiation. About a quarter of the patients had newly diagnosed metastatic disease and about a quarter of the patient had locally advanced disease or not candidates for surgery and were treated with hormones and radiation therapy. And you can see their, their Gleason scores, the grade of the cancer, most of the patients had high grade cancer. Um, they had some you know, FSH levels, I'm not worried about that. But look at the cardiovascular risk factors. This is a study population in Europe and Asia and all over. And you can see lifestyle factors that patients had. These include smoking, and obesity, 67% of patients had one of those risk factors. And then if you look at cardiovascular or cerebrovascular risk factors, a prior heart attack or stroke, um, I'm sorry, this was, that's, that, that's the last one. This cardiovascular risk factors included things like high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, um, diabetes. This is 80% of patients in the study had these risk factors. So this is, these are so prevalent. In our, in our older male population that we see this even in the patients selected for study. In a history of a MACE, a MACE, and we'll talk about it, these are major adverse cardiovascular events. And in particular, we're talking about stroke and heart attack. There's about one in seven patients 
had a prior stroke or heart attack. And believe it or not, that's probably low for the real population. We have our performance statuses, how functional they are. Most of them were really asymptomatic, highly functional. You can see um, the patient that had prior radiation or prior hormonal therapy and their PSAs and testosterone levels to start. This is really the key slide. This shows in black that luprolide, that testosterone flare uh, that we talked about. Uh, when you get this initial surge of testosterone, it actually goes up in these patients and then it comes down. With Rolugolex, we see almost an immediate drop in that testosterone levels and it stays down throughout the entire study period. Again, it was actually superior to the Luprolac. And then notice at the end, uh, at the end of 49 weeks, we stopped therapy. And a month later, we're starting to see that testosterone recovery. One of the really good things about Rolugolex is that when you stop the pill, not the next day or the next week, but within one to three months, we can see testosterone recovery in about half of the patients. And that's really important if we have complications or if we wanna do a defined period of time of treatment and then stop it to know that it can recover. In fact, they did a sub-study, just a limited number of patients here, about 184 patients. And um, between Aurelia Golex and Luprolite, they looked at them for not, not for just 30 days, for, the whole, for a whole 90 day of follow-up and that's where we're able to see about half of the patients recovering their testosterone in the Rolugolex arm and very few in the Luprolide arm getting up near where we would consider a normal testosterone. And then the other key factor, I mentioned this earlier, cardiovascular events. Um, if you look at those sudden death events, they were three times as high in the Luprolide arm, about 3% versus 1% in the Rolugolex arm. And if we look specifically at these MACE events, again, on the bottom, that's major adverse cardiac event, such as heart attack, stroke, or sudden death. Um, you can see 2.9% versus 6.2%, a 54% reduction in the risk of a MACE event, just in this one year treatment period. And again, if you look at the patients with a history of the MACE event, remember that, that one in seven, population that had a history of, a, of one of these events in the past, it was 3.6% versus 17.8%. 17.8%, that's, that's one in six men having a heart attack, a stroke, or sudden death from Luprolide just in this one year period versus just 3%. Folks, these are dramatic differences um, that we're seeing here, and they really are confirming what we saw with the other GNRH antagonists. Uh, in the other analyses. And this is what those cumulative incidence events look like. And notice how quickly these curves separate, how quickly the event rate goes up in the Luprolide arm in just the first 12 weeks. That tells me this isn't being caused by weight gain or muscle loss or visceral fat or, or even diabetes or blood pressure. This is really something that's more direct effect happening and it's happening early on, maybe with that surge maybe with some other mechanisms, but we're seeing that pretty quickly. And then the rates continue to rise in both arms all the way up. So you're not spared this risk with Rodeogolex, but it is clearly less than what we see in the Luprolide group. And I think that along with this ease of access oral administration is what makes me so excited about this therapy and the ability to to build on this. We're gonna to have to treat some men with prostate cancer with more aggressive hormonal therapies. We're gonna to need to do that in order to keep them alive because the prostate cancer in some men is a major risk. But we gotta do it in a way that balances and minimizes these cardiovascular risks and hopefully other risks too. And I think this drug, Relicolex, has a real chance to do that. It's gonna be hurdles in terms of changing um, clinicians' views on this and convincing them this is worth changing and, and that they're used to just ordering a, the IV, the, 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 the injectable GNRH agonists and they have no trouble from payers for it. These are all hurdles that will have to be overcome, but we're going to have to do that because it's just a smarter, safer, easier way we could do it. We're going to need to find a way to get everybody on board to do that. Survivors are living um, with or after hormonal therapies longer than ever. And they're living with the consequences, cardiac, metabolic, skeletal, and cognitive and mood changes. 
And I think this constellation is similar to what's happening with aging, just at an accelerated rate. And it's resulting in the end game of frailty, which is really an irreversible state that ultimately leads to a lot of suffering and death in our patients. And identifying these populations that are greatest risk for these complications, whether they're cardiovascular or other issues, is going to be key in intervening as much as we can to try to mitigate or at least slow those processes is key. And I think this drug, Relegolex or Ogovix, appears to lower the cardiovascular complication risks associated with hormonal therapy, antrim deprivation therapy. And to me, it's a product improvement, not just for the convenience and, and ease, but also for the health of our patients. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dr. George. What a great overview. Um, so helpful, I know, for our, for our patients and for the caregivers listening um, this evening. We do have a couple of questions coming in, so we'll take a handful of those before we sign off for the night. Um, the first one that came in is really just regarding um, some things that can improve uh, bone, mass, bone mass and reduce the risk of osteoporosis. And the specific question is, um, can strength training and appropriate joint loading help um, improve bone mass and reduce the risk of osteoporosis and what kinds of studies and research have been done or are maybe are being done? Yeah, no, it's a great question. There's a lot of work that's going on in that area. Um, some of the work going on at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and, and, and MGH and, and actually at our own place at Duke as well, looking at the, uh, the effects of exercise on, on DEXA scans and and uh, on, on strength testing and, and cardiopulmonary exercise kind of fitness, if you will, for our patients. And, and the reality is, is that there's, um, there's, a, there's a lot that can be done. And, and, and just, you know, even relatively light, um, uh, you know, resistance uh, training can really help. Um, we do like impact. Uh, so, so walking is good. Jogging is better. Um, but for a lot of joints that difficult for people to do. So that's where some of the strength um, exercises can really help. Um, one of the things we found um, when we looked at not necessarily directly osteoporosis, but, but at sort of muscle strength and, uh, and fitness was um, we did a, a study of men starting on hormonal therapy and, uh, and did, did a, a prescribed exercise, one-on-one -on -one, on-site exercising three times a week. And uh, in cardiopulmonary exercise testing, we demonstrated, uh, and we presented this, it's going to be published soon. We demonstrated that um, men who are going on hormonal therapy within their first four months of going on hormonal therapy age, essentially in their fitness 10 years. I mean, I, I can't stress how important that is. Uh, it's like 10 years of aging in terms of your fitness in just a matter of four months. And this was largely mitigated with exercise. And, and in particular, one exercise. You know what the exercise was, Shelby? What? You never guess. It was leg press. Oh, leg wow. press. If you think about gluteus, that's the biggest muscle in your body. And that, that muscle atrophies the fastest. You know? and, and leg press is a muscle exercise that really focuses on the gluteus. And when we do this cardiopulmonary exercise testing, we put them on a treadmill and we have them walking. And then we start raising the incline. And that's where you start using your gluteus. And because it's the biggest muscle, it tires the path. And if you think about men on hormonal therapy, what kind of happens is they kind of lose their butt and they kind of gain their belly. And it's kind of like a little shift like that. So, um, so leg press is the best thing. Now, I think, you know, again, you, you know, there's other things you could probably do to help your glutes and stuff. You, you probably know better than I do, Shelby, but um, there's, there's a lot of really great exercises out there. And uh, I would just encourage you not just to walk, but to talk to some physical therapists or exercise physiologists about mm -hmm. even people at your gym about what exercises you could do that could help strengthen, you know, your muscles and, and do some of that impact training and some of that muscle training. Yeah, no, I love that. That's such such real life, tangible um, ways to <laughs> make some yeah. small changes. And you I look went for a run too. today and started uphill, and it was awful. It makes there the whole run harder. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Excellent. Yeah, great, great point. That's exciting. Um, so we have another uh, question that's really just about making a switch from one therapy to another. So um, would what would warrant making a switch from an injectable to an oral? Would, would a man um, need to wait until the PSA begins to rise or is making that switch, um, would, would something else maybe indicate making the switch? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Shelby, because a lot of the things I talked about are really insidious, right? You're not going to feel a cardiovascular change, right? Until it's too late, right? And you're not going to feel osteoporosis. You're not going to feel different changes like that, right? But, um, but the, the reality is, is that I think anybody who's on chronic, you know, androgen deprivation therapy, it's reasonable to ask your physician about a switch. And there's a couple of things to think about, like the timing, when would you do it? We'd probably make that switch when the next injection is due. If you just got an injection, there doesn't make any sense to start taking a pill for something that you already have the injection in your body for. But before you do the next injection to start the pill at that time. The second thing would be insurance, right? Because you wanna know, is it gonna get covered? And if it's not gonna get covered, um, well, what can we do? Whether, you know, thankfully the Myelvan people have set up a really nice program to get um, coverage to give you essentially free drug supply for the first two months. So you can kind of work through those coverage issues, but that's something you could work on even before you get that, that, that next injection is, is kind of due. So it kind of gives you a lead time to do that. And you don't have to wait until the PSA is progressing. This isn't necessarily um, something that's going to work, you know, better than the injection. I mean, I think it, we do see a lower testosterone level as more superior continuous suppression, but I'm not sure that's the mechanism that's driving the resistance. So I wouldn't necessarily wait for, for you know, failure of one therapy to switch to another. I would think about doing that sooner rather than later in my chronic patients. Okay. Yeah, really good tips. Um, let's see, we have probably time um, for one more question. Um, one person is asking if there have been any clinical studies done on people who have um, sarcoidosis. Yeah, so great question. You know, it's so, it's, it's so frustrating sometimes because you look at conditions like this um, and you realize a lot of these patients are not represented in our clinical trial populations. Mm -hmm you know, they're excluded. There'll be a, a, an exclusion criteria that says any other chronic condition that may interfere with, you know, study visits or something. And so, or study assessments, you know, patients who have sarcoidosis can have lymph nodes. And then it becomes confusing. Is that lymph node from cancer? Is it from sarcoid? And so they get excluded from clinical trials. And it's, it's very frustrating. It's wrong, frankly, because in the real world, we have to deal with these questions and we need to know these issues. So could there be interactions between these hormonal therapies and sarcoid? I don't know of any direct link to that. So the, the, you know, the short answer is we, we don't know, but um, the reason we don't know is probably because not enough of those patients have been studied in clinical trials to really understand that. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I don't have more to offer you, but at least an understanding explanation of why. Yeah, so many criteria to consider when, when we're looking at clinical trials. Um, well, with that, uh, Dr. George, I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Such a great overview on, on the general ADT, but also this really new and exciting therapy. I mean, we're really seeing a boom in um, FDA approvals, and this is just one more tool in our tool belt to help treat patients. So um, we're, we're thrilled you've been a part of our 2021 um, unfortunately, virtual summit, we are, are um, hoping to be in person next year. We would love for you to join us. Um, again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, my event for helping us make this valuable content available and for connecting us with you, Dr. George. So um, thanks again for taking the time. My pleasure. Take care, everybody. Thank you. And thanks again to our attendees. Uh, stay tuned. We have another exciting talk coming your way. Um, this one is on a new groundbreaking technology called Byte technology. So we're really excited to bring this to you. Um, and for more information, please visit our website at zerocancer.org.